Hey guys, so today I'm going to be talking about Lev S. Vygotsky. Vygotsky was born on November 17, 1896, in Orsha, Belarus. Belarus is a country in Eastern Europe, which until 1991 was a part of the Soviet Union. Vygotsky was also born Jewish, and thus both Jewish and Russian culture were influential on Vygotsky's thinking. For example, two Hebrew texts, the Talmud and the Torah, greatly impacted his historical and dialectical view of science throughout his career. Vygotsky attended the Sanovatsky Moscow City People's University and studied a plethora of subjects, including psychology. His psychology education was not traditional, but he was very well read, and thus he inherited a multidisciplinary approach to psychology. Also influential on his work was his persistent struggle with tuberculosis, which propelled Vygotsky to hurriedly finish the bulk of his work in 10 years, a feat which caused much of his work to be incredibly confusing to the public, even some 80 years later. As I previously mentioned, Vygotsky was born in 1896. When Vygotsky was still a teenager, in 1914, Russia entered World War I in defense of Serbia against Austria and Hungary. During this time, Russia was still under the rule of a czar, which is essentially an emperor of Russia. However, in 1917, the same year that Vygotsky graduated from Moscow State University with a law degree, the Russian Revolution started. The Russian Revolution was the end of the Tsar rule and the end of the Romanov dynasty and the beginning of the Bolsheviks rule, which was led by Vladimir Lenin. The Bolshevi Bolsheviks believed in communism which was a political theory created by Karl Marx, which advocates public ownership of property. In 1924, Vygotsky moved to Moscow permanently, and in 1925, he completed his dissertation, which analyzes Hamlet's psyche during his impending death. In 1929, Joseph Stalin becomes a dictator, which takes Russia from a peasant society to more of a militaristic society under totalitarianism rule. In 1931, Vygotsky still very much believes in the Communist Party, and thus him and his peer organize expeditions to peasant villages to determine if their theory that individuals in peasant villages will change their thought process when communism and education are introduced. Unfortunately, Vygotsky was not able to attend the expeditions due to his chronic bouts of tuberculosis. However, it was deemed by his partner that his theory was correct. After the expeditions, the Communist Party begins to alienate Vygotsky because of his education level and his ideals that um, childhood education should involve cross-cultural studies and a certain amount of socialization. This was really difficult for Vygotsky to accept because the Communist Party was to him his family and thus he went through a phase of great depression after he was alienated from the Communist Party. Shortly after, in 1934, Vygotsky dies, and two years after he dies in 1936, the Central Committee bans pedology. Pedology was essentially the study of, um, of how childhood education should work. Pedology highly advocated for academic testing and improvement of childhood education circumstance. Vygotsky was very, very active 
in this field and therefore with the banning of pedology much of Vygotsky's work was suppressed and therefore much of it was not read until after Stalin's death. Vygotsky became very interested in Marxism early on in his academic career. He favored Marxism as a departure from the feudalistic Russian society, and he saw it as an opportunity for equality, especially considering his Jewish background, which meant that in feudalistic Russia, he was often persecuted against. Vygotsky was often described as an idealist, which meant he didn't really recognize the mass oppression which accompanied communism and only really saw the positives that came out of it. He actually ended up at the, towards the end of his life, as I mentioned before, becoming at odds with a lot of the communist leaders because of his high level of education and his ideals um, that education should be maximized for children and that cross-cultural studies were very important. Like many Russian academics before him, Vygotsky's academic explorations started with art, specifically the psychology of art. In his doctoral thesis, he analyzed Hamlet, a Shakespearean character, and his means of grappling with his impending death. Vygotsky himself is said to self-identify with Hamlet because of his own struggle with chronic illness. As Vygotsky became more involved with Russian politics, he also developed what is known as Vygotsky's Marxist hypothesis with his peer, Alexander Loria. The two hypothesized that introducing schooling and communism would shift the thought process in traditional villages from what Vygotsky referred to as primitive to more modern and scientific. Luria's expeditions to the villages of Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan seemed to confirm Vygotsky's hypothesis. Vygotsky did not travel with him due to his chronic bouts of tuberculosis. Another popular concept Vygotsky introduced was the zone of proximal development, which he explained as the gap between the actual development and the potential of development determined through problem solving. Today, U.S. psychologists refer to this concept as scaffolding or cooperative learning. Essentially, this concept employs working with others who are more advanced to achieve higher academic success, or the colloquial term, two heads are better than one. Today, in U.S. psychology, many academics read Vygotsky's work and pick and choose applicable concepts while disregarding much of his Marxist-oriented work. Okay, so we can end with some questions. Uh, my first question is, a main theme in the article we read today was the utilization of psychology as a political tool. Do you think that because many of Vygotsky's ideas were used by the Communist Party to advance their agenda, that the ideas lose their merit? The second question is, Share your thoughts on Vygotsky's Marxist hypothesis. Do you think his hypothesis was culturally biased against peasant classes? And then the third question is, do you think it's acceptable for modern day United States psychologists to take only pieces of Vygotsky's ideas or do you think a work should be considered within its entire context?